Yes, and we are live for the first edition of the African Basketball Conversation. You see what COVID is forcing us to do, Femi? <laughs> right, right. But it's all good. Um, thank God for technology. We still uh, feel like you know we are um, in each other's presence, and um, we are having that conversation that we want to have. You know, regardless of not being in the same geographical location. So um, I'm just excited. You know that we can we can still do this regardless of um, COVID nineteen. Um, I just hope that very soon we it becomes something of the past and we get back to our normal lives. I just can't wait for that time. I know, I know, I know. But thank you for thinking of this brilliant idea of bringing together uh, the great African basketball minds across the continent to talk about very relevant topics. So. Um, I see there are already eight people on the live. If you want, we can give them a bit more time to log on. Um, yeah, I think we should do. Um, I mean, let's, let's just give about two, three minutes and, and just see how many people can catch up. Um, yeah. with, with us. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's immense, an immense pleasure to have you guys um, log on and, and join us in, in this beautiful conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm super excited about what uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, we, you know, it's it's going to be for those who are just tuning in. It's going to be about seventy five minutes long, but really, it could be a three day event. Like we could talk about absolutely. this. <laughs> you know, you, you know what? To, to be honest with you, um, in the later stages when I was trying to, um, you know, plan out, you know, the conversation, the direction we're going. Because it was actually very intentional, um, just calling it the Africa basketball conversation. I'm not putting any sub ads or themes uh, because I just felt, you know what, let's just dive into this and see what Africa is saying, what we react to, um, what our people back home um, would, would pick interest in. And um, at that point, I felt we perhaps, you know, had too much to chew uh, with regards to the amount. Um, of of um, discussion that, that we want to have. And by the time I reached out to everybody on this lovely panel, everyone signaled their interest to come in. And I'm like, oh, this is this is a whole squad, you know, 12, <laughs> a whole basketball squad, yeah, for the tournament. And, uh, you know, I, I began to rack my head as to, hope oh, I didn't ask for too much, but, but, I, but, I, but I'm sure we, we will be able to take care of things with professional... Uh, uh, professionals and yes, I know for a fact that at some point we might perhaps uh, be making this a two-day, three-day event, um, just so everybody can be heard. I mean, there are 52 countries in Africa. Um, today we're representing those nine, and we look like we are so much <laughs> already. <laughs> so I'm just excited about you know what what the future holds. Uh, but but it's really good to be here today and um, to witness this very remarkable day. Absolutely. Uh, well, we have 18 people on the live. I think that's good enough for me to get started. So I'll hand the reins over to you. Uh, first and foremost, Femi, uh, why don't you let us know, let the people know what this is all about. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you once again for joining uh, us um, in the African Basketball Conversation, um, the first of its kind. I, I must say um, it's an honor and a huge privilege uh, to have this opportunity you know, of convening this landmark event. Uh, my journey into basketball on the sidelines started sometime around 2012. After, of course, I dumped my dreams of playing basketball professionally, um, just at the age of 22. Uh, I know a lot of people would want to say, perhaps you are not good enough, that's why you dropped out. But, but the truth is, um, we know the peculiarities of Africa. And I mean, I am just one of a thousand, a million kids, you know, who, who love the game, who want to play the sports, but for one reason or the other, which are, you know, the topics we will be talking about um, in this conversation, um, why, you know, that, that sort of happened. But, but I'm glad I was, I was able to represent my school. I was able to um, play for my university. I'm not like Victor Muzadi, you know, who was able to go to the Olympics and win uh, three Afro basket titles. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm a journalist and that was how we started. Um, deciding, you know, to find a spot for myself. When I say a spot, S-P-O-T, 
um, in regards to showing my passion for the game. And right. it's, been, it's been a very fantastic journey, I must say. I, I remember um, in 2013, um, when I made that audacious move after I quit in 2012, um, to go to Ivory Coast for the FIBA Africa Journalist Training, we were just a handful of, of, of journalists there. I took a two-day road trip. That story is for another day. Uh, but it was just part of, you know, how much my passion was burning to still be a part of the game, even though I knew quite all right that, I mean, I was ahead of time in terms of age and a lot of other factors uh, wasn't going to help me unless um, my potential. But cut long story short, 2018, I had the opportunity, you know, to gravitate through four or five Afro basket championships to the NBA, you know, went to um, Los Angeles, um, Staples Center, went to um, the United Center in Chicago and Indianapolis um, as well. And it, it dawned on me at that point, you know, that basketball in Africa is missing something. Um, comparing, you know, my experience with traveling to almost six cities across Africa at our major tournaments. And, and, and that birth um, this conversation and that birth and the organization that is um, hosting this conversation, Balls Activating Literacy, you know, and Leadership in, in Africa. Um, I, I want to tell you guys that this is about impact. You know, it's not just a one-off or, you know, you're coming together or some people who just like to talk or want to talk. Everybody in this panel is very passionate. You know, they have invested um, not just you know, their bodies, their time, their energy um, to this game. And they just want to see it grow. They want to see it develop. They want they want to see it, you know, become more than it is. And um, to be honest with you, I, I'll tell you that my dream um, with this conversation is for one day an African basketball player on this continent will be able to stand or sit in the same room with Aubameyang, with Sergio Mane, and there will be no difference. Um, they won't feel any less because they are professional athletes, um, regardless of whether they play at home or they're in diaspora. You know, my dream, my goal um, is also to see, you know, that we will be celebrating basketball players, you know, even more. Um, maybe I'll just throw it out there. Who says we can have an African Basketball Player of the Year awards um, celebrating local teams out here? Um, that, that, that's something that I think would be very prestigious for us to do and um, to put basketball, you know, in a very good conversation. Um, and lastly, um, I, I want to see um, African clubs um, on TV every other weekend. Um, kudos to the football leagues. Um, we have the PSL, the Absa Premier League, we have the Zambian League, we have the Kenyan League on TV. Um, why not the basketball leagues on TV? Um, why not promote these players? So those are the burning um, issues, really, that has pushed me to get to this point. I would say, you know what? You know, we need to start having these conversations. We need to start meeting with the people who make these decisions and start looking for ways, you know, helping find solutions to getting basketball to that place where we all desire. And that is a very big dream for us. And I must say this before I close, um, that we... Are planning to stand on the shoulders of those you know who are before us who are doing great you know the nba africa is doing an immense job um in trying to promote the sport um the the giants of africa the seed project the nba academy trying to um, help with youth development and youth impact but we, we also um are, are looking you know to create impact in some other ways more than one sports has a huge value chain um, from coaching, you know, to playing, you know, to medicine, you, you can go on and on. I'm a journalist, for example. So there's a handful, handful of opportunity to develop the sports, not just about the talent, not just about players going out to play in foreign leagues. You know, if we develop the leagues, we can develop a structure and ecosystem where basketball can be, you know, a morning spinning, revenue generating um, sport on the continent. And um, just like everyone is celebrating the Basketball Africa League, I think, you know, the lower tier also needs to be looked at because only a few will be able to enjoy that bounty of playing there. But if you are coming out from not so very competitive and financially rewarding leagues, we might not just be having the best product, you know, at that level. So that, that's really um, the backstory behind, you know, the African basketball conversation. That's why we are here. It's 
it's a marathon it's not even the half marathon it's not even a quarter mile it's, it's a long haul so this is the first of many editions to come we won't be in a hurry to announce anything yet but i just want you guys to please join us in the conversation let us know what is burning in your heart you know let us um give us feedback on social media you know and let's continue this conversation because it's important that you know basketball gets to that level you know where we can celebrate our stars as much as we celebrate the football stars on the continent that's the vision that's the dream and thank you very much for the honor um i want to say congratulations to the super team all our 11 panelists and madam moderator uh, for being a part of this historic event i wish you guys um all the very best as we move on thank you guys Thank you so much, uh, Femi. And uh, basically, case in point, the African Basketball Conversation was created to provide a platform where the 11 people, or rather 10 people you're gonna be listening to, um, can share their views on different issues around African basketball. These are people from different parts of the continent. So I'd like us to dive in to our very first topic. Um, and I will be inviting um, our guests in after we introduce the topic. Uh, we'll be looking at post-COVID outlook for basketball leagues within Africa. And we have a representative from uh, Tunisia. We have someone from Cameroon, Angola, and Ivory Coast. I'm going to get them on here right now. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Hello, Bayrem. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine also. Femi, how are you? <laughs> Femi, in backstage, I think, huh? Ah, yes, we put him in backstage yeah. so that uh, I can create some space to invite the rest. We have um, Mr. Yves Tsala from Cameroon. He is uh, yeah. president of the regional league. Bienvenue, Yves. Uh, thank you, Silalei. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to, to be right here with you, uh, be part of this uh, important project. Uh, Femi, thank you for the great initiative. Great, thank you so much. Also, have, Hello, um, everyone. Victor Muzadi. Um, if I give Hi, everyone. Him, nice. yeah, it will take us all day. So I'm, not even, I'm just going to tell you his name. Uh, but really? Olympia. You studied on me at the start? <laughs> <laughs> it's, good that. To it's always a pleasure thanks for me for the invitation and for the concept that you built to have everybody together actually for the same goal and share the audience and actually you know give a little bit of some info some info from different parts of africa that's really important to show that uh, we can really do something together be bigger than what uh, we are now Absolutely. Um, and we still have one more uh, panelist from Ivory Coast. Um, we'll give him a chance to log on. But in the meantime, I'd like us to dive right into our topic, gentlemen. Um, we're talking about post-COVID outlook for basketball leagues within Africa. We're moving to a point where um, leagues are opening up. And I actually want us to use the case study of uh, Tunisia, who yeah. had to shut down early um, when COVID happened and then they opened it up and they've continued it where they left off. Bayram, can you tell us a little bit more about the experience around that and what have been the pros and cons around opening up the league when you have? First of all, I want to thank uh, Femi for organizing this event. Also, uh, the African Basketball Conversation is a great opportunity to highlight uh, African basketball and to share stories uh, in many countries. In Tunisia, basketball is the third most popular sport after football and handball. But the, for the players and the fans, it's their life and the passion that never dies. Unfortunately, with this pandemic situation, many leagues were cancelled and also an opportunity like BAL, Basketball African League, is postponed for the end of the year. But let's check how Tunisia Basketball Federation managed this situation. In Tunisia, the first case of uh, COVID-19 was detected on March 1st. And uh, uh, in mid-March, we reached 20 cases. The last match of bas basketball was played uh, on March 14th. 
after two days, the Federation has decided to stop the league for a time. Then, to encourage people to stay at home, uh, the players, coaches made video to invite them not to go out. Even the Federation has broadcast historical match from previous Afro baskets, World Cups of basketball, and Olympic tournaments. After a month, the first meeting between Federation and clubs was held online to discuss the situation and how to resume playing basketball. Federation took other decisions. For me, they were important to support clubs in this difficult situation, like the exception of clubs from financial debts uh, and 50% rejection from the, the, uh, the player salaries until the end of the season. After that, the health ministry has given the green light to resume trainings after having a stability of the pandemic situation. A health protocol has been put in place. We come back to that later. Individual tra training resumed on June 4th, let's say, after a week uh, collective trainings. And then a whole agenda and planning was made by the Federation to, to continue games by the league, for, 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 from the league and for the Cubs for, for both men and women. The health protocol was sent to the clubs by the end of the month of May. Among the decision in this protocol, we can uh, cite setting up committee made up of doctors to watch of the, the, the club players and uh, setting up coordinator to assure the application of this protocol and to train the employee of the arena and halls. Disinfecting halls, locker rooms, boards, boards, substitute bench, scores tables, and the stand before and after practicing our games. Ventilation of the arena and opening the windows during tra trainings and matches. Also, they provide two entry for each team so as not to cross paths. And at each entry, a temperature measurement into the arena and providing the hand sanitizers around the hall. Also, each team uh, had uh, two changing rooms and the obligation to wear the mask in the basketball arena. Social distance, no picks before the match, no kissing, no handshakings. Also, no press conference, only interviewing on the floor. And the important thing, testing all the players before resuming the training and the matches. The, the, the federation was severe and the suspension and the fine for each club that does not respect these measures. For the fans, in the beginning, let's say 120 fans from the local team and 20 for the visitors were allocated. In the, in the, uh, during the, the month of July and uh, the beginning of August, the, ma the match of uh, both men and women took place in good situations. However, the virus hasn't, has taken over since the, the opening of the borders. That's why additional decisions are taken in, uh, by the Federation, like the cancellation of the rest of the season for youth section and making the cup final and the rest second division games behind closed doors ah yeah in a, in a bubble like uh formation yes uh but, but uh how huh? so so the remaining of the of the senior league and you said for the second division um the champions cup will be played in like a bubble like the yes. formation yes 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 but, but uh the, the the end of the, this season uh last week i think and we have agenda for the next season. Yes, the next season of uh, Tunisian basketball will be in uh, on October seventh, I think. I think we succeeded to resume the activity of basketball. Uh, as the president of the federation said one time, we wanted to award the title on the floor, and the best, uh, the, the best have won. Thereby, I congratulate uh, US Mo Monastir for winning the double, and I wish hard luck for the other clubs. But there is a luck. The audience, the atmosphere, the club songs, this upper sub. Sports without fans in the stand, like the history with uh, salt and, uh, and food. Yeah. We miss encouraging teams, yelling out loud to push them and to boost the player. 
Moreover, the players did not celebrate their wins with their supporters. Finally, as I said, uh, first uh, for the player and the fans, basketball is their life and a passion that never dies. No barrier can prevent them from following this passion, even this invisible enemy called COVID-19. Yeah, and as MJ right. said, obstacles, as, as MJ said, obstacles don't have to stop you. If you run into a wall, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it, go through it, work around it. Thank you, babe. But, thank you so much for you. that. Uh, and sorry to cut you off. I just want to give the rest of, a chance um, to speak. Uh, Reggie, yeah, yeah. you you heard about um, those very uh, stringent guidelines for the Tunisia League to actually kick off, and even with those guidelines, the cases still went up, and they were they had to scrap the youth league. Um, Ivory Coast uh, has the league coming up, uh, starting up soon, correct? So is yeah. Ivory Coast ready to implement those kinds of measures um, in order to have a safe functioning league? Uh, in Ivory Coast, uh, we stopped the championship uh, in March, but uh, with the help of the health ministry, we are we are supposed to run the uh, run the season uh, before 2021. So, uh, with the help of the Ministry of Health, we can we can uh, respect all the measure. Okay, so Ivory Coast is ready to do what they need to do. They have the funding. They have the facilities. Um, they have the equipment that is needed to make sure they can have a COVID-free functioning league. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the Ministry of Health uh, uh, mentored the federations. And uh, I think in uh, two months, we'll be ready. Okay, okay. Yeah, we'll be it's, ready. It's interesting that um, the government... Um, help with that. Victor, how are things going in Angola? I know, what is it uh, to the restart? Um, are you getting government support to have the, the measures needed to start a um, COVID-free league, or how is that working? Um, hi, everyone. I slightly have for this opportunity, Femi. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have that crazy transition about the COVID-19. Uh, almost at the end of the, the regular season in Angola, where we have uh, Coach Ali, uh, Dingo Noo Lazar with his boys from Petro basically uh, beating everybody around, and uh, they was looking like they will won the championship. But uh, because of the pandemic situation, we have to cancel the, the championship, and the last <laughs> this opportunity actually to win this championship. So far, uh, a lot of things be done around, we are uh, on June 5th, federations and clubs meet with the Minister of Sports, uh, Minister of Sports, and uh, we, they talk uh, about how it's going to be post-COVID, and they set up a month of October, actually, to get back um, to the competition and sport activities. But for what the, the, the Minister of Health saying in Angola, it looked like in September, end of September, uh, and right now, August, we're gonna have the, 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 the peak. This is gonna be like the, the, the higher point from, from, from COVID-19. So we're going, we, so far we have only like 2000 people infected and look like we're gonna go uh, to the roof right now. So we're not sure about starting in October and um, during those few days, maybe next month, next week, we're gonna have from Sport Health um, Council, uh, some guideline on how we're going to treat the the the, the facilities and uh, the players, what kind of protocol teams have to apply to have at least players get back to trainings and etc. So what we have so far is players doing their own workout, uh, some one-on-one -on -one skills trainings. We have uh, Petro already make a move, a con 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 contract a, a trainer from Brazil. And uh, we have a Ningo no after all those years who 
actually run the show and win a lot of things here out from petrol. So yeah, we, we, we're going slow, make sure that everybody is safe and uh, we can actually push that without, you know, putting lives in, 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 uh, in danger. Okay. All right. Now, um, I'm actually brought in a very, um, interesting point. Uh, the aspect of fans, uh, it's, it's huge for African culture. Uh, we, we play with the fans more than, than anyone else really. Um, how will that affect, uh, the basketball situation in Ivory Coast, for instance, regime? Do you think the players will be able to perform, um, at a normal level during the games? Um, despite not having fans in the gym? Uh, I don't think so. I, think, I don't think so, but uh, we are obliged to, to play. We are obliged to play. So uh, the last weekend, uh, the Federation has organized a skill day challenge uh, with a slam dunk tournament, uh, a one-on-one -on -one contest, uh, but uh, it's difficult to play without uh, fans. It's difficult to play uh, without fans, but we are obliged. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are obliged. We have no other choice, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you, you seemed the most uh, discouraged about the fact that there, there won't be fans, um, you know? Do you think that the level of uh, basketball in Tunisia will be maintained despite not having that kind of energy in the gym? Yes, the, the, the fans are very important, uh, except in uh, also in Tunisia. And there, there are teams which, uh, and there, there are where arenas with fans. It's there, it's very difficult to play there. To play in arena with the fans, it's uh, to win there. It's very difficult. And I think uh, it, we we can't have the, the the real situation and the actual uh, strength of uh, each team without their fans they, they they need their fans okay all right um victor i'd love to hear as we wrap up this section just briefly what are your views on that how will angola who also have some of the the the, the most intense and energetic fans across the continent handle um not being able to watch the games and how will the players more importantly and not having that kind of uh, support. First of all, I want to I, I want to say that I see that in different way. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity finally to get a transition to our sport, to bring more digital solution to sport, have more more um, solution, virtual solutions. I know that it's not it's not it's that good to have um, fans around, but for the safety ness and the reach that will impose us to finally get clubs to grow in invest on technology. This, that's the thing. This is what a lot of coaches overseas uh, are lost when they look for sport in Africa. They're like, okay, I want to see content. I want to know what kind of training they have, what kind of you know players they have, and etc. So now we have we, we we touch a point that without technology, we cannot make it like monetize what we do what we do all the content all the games we cannot monetize that without without technology so we can don't have to see just on one side of the problem we have to see another one that we can we, from none on we have to bring that together like the, the fans and the technology virtual uh, technology to actually grow and survive this new phase right right okay well, um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Really much appreciated. I think uh, we've given up our time for that particular conversation. Um, so now I'd like us to move on to the next one. And I am going to take you guys out as we invite our next speaker. Again, thank you so much for your thoughts on that topic. Our next topic is going to be about the stunted growth of basketball in Africa. It's essentially the the major factors. We feel like Africa really struggles with um, commercializing the sport on the continent, like the NBA has. So we're gonna have um, different topics around this um, major conversation. The first one is uh, on management, and I'd like to invite the president of the regional league from Cameroon, Mr. Eve Sala. Eve, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, Silale. And I'm, and I'm sorry, uh, 
I had the connection network problem. So uh, uh, finally, uh, I, I didn't speak about uh, the case in Cameroon uh, for the first conversation. It's okay. Don't worry. I'm sure you you represent very well on this uh, next topic, and I'm sure you have a lot to say as a president of a regional league. So we're talking about uh, management, the mismanagement of leagues in, in, in relation to the stunted growth of basketball in Africa. Um, a lot of players, um, especially in East Africa, and you can tell us how it is in West Africa, believe that the problem lies with federation management. Do you think that is the case? Yeah, I think uh, mostly is the case because, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you, you want to set a definition of the, the management, you will say that it's the art uh, to combine uh, human uh, means and material means to, to uh, achieve some objective. That's the definition. And if you, you say that, uh, it means that the, the manager should have objectives. And it is not uh, most, most often the, the case uh, because uh, what, what are the objectives of the manager? You, you, we always ask and they, they can't answer. And we, we should, you, you should have a vision, a vision that you, you can share uh, with the stakeholders and, and you, you don't know it, you, you can't feel it. And if you, you see uh, all the other aspects of the, the resources, uh, uh, especially human resources, it mm. is a, a very a big problem because I think that the federation should have uh, at least to 20 persons working every day, uh, some paid uh, and paid uh, uh, people working, volunteering, and uh, you, you don't have it, you don't have it. And you see, when you, you arrive um, at, at the, the management of the federation, uh, you should I can say you can you should see what is the the environment and to to make a, a SWOT analysis to to set objectives to to write a, a, a strategic plan operational plan so that we can uh, make a monitoring you you don't see all those aspects and uh, I can say that yes we, we have a mismanagement finally of the the federation. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that that, that mismanag mismanagement rather comes from a lack of understanding about how to run a profitable basketball league in Africa? You know, you have some of these people um, holding these leadership uh, positions in, in uh, federations without a full understanding about the responsibility of a secretary general, uh, the responsibility of the head of marketing and, and publicity. So maybe is there a lack of understanding or of education in that regard? Yes, uh, we, we can see it because we have uh, two, two profiles of managers. We have uh, some who are uh, study uh, management and those who are just elect by politics. And when you, you are elect by politics, you should uh, uh, hire manager to, to, to see all the aspects of organization. And mm. that, that is the, the problem. You, you talk about uh, marketing. Uh, exactly, because you, you, you need uh, to have qualified personnel to chase sponsors, etc., and you, you don't have it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for those views. Um, I trust that you're implementing what you've talked about in uh, your federation and in your as you run your league as well. Thank you so much, um, Eve. I'm going to take you out now, but we will have you back later for some more insights. My pleasure, Silani. All right, we're going to move on to the next topic, which is a uh, rather subtopic, which is media and publicity. Now, we know the NBA generates the bulk of its revenue from selling TV rights. Is that something that we need to implement in African basketball culture? What is the role of media and publicity? We all know the woes when we go to a marketing department and they ask for numbers. Show us viewership numbers. Show us all kinds of numbers that most federations don't even have and aren't even keeping track of. So what is the importance of media and publicity? And for this, I'm going to bring in 
Adedami, who is the CEO and founder of Bibom Niger. If you guys are not following this, you absolutely should. Uh, they have great insights on African basketball and especially Nigerian basketball. Adedami, good to have you. Um, now, I can't hear you. Let me unmute you. Yeah, can you hear me now? I think oh, my mic was muted. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Um, I'd also doing? like to and invite um, Reggie back to this conversation. Um, he is the founder of um, the, I believe it's, it's a... It's a Iwa e Basket. Exactly. Co-founder. Co exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you gentlemen know um, how important it is to tell African basketball stories. And um, for myself, who's also been a TV uh, presenter uh, with Bake, I think one of the ways to generate excitement around the sport is to share the stories of players, of um, uh, different factors that are affecting uh, basketball on Africa. How important is media and publicity to elevate the growth of basketball in Africa? Let's start with you, um, Adedami. Um, like, like you rightly said, um, media rights is everything for professional sports around the world. That is where they generate the bulk of their revenue. If you look at the NBA, they generate as much as five billion dollars out of the eight billion dollars for media rights. The same thing with the Premier League. So, if you want to grow sports in Africa, basketball in Africa, then you need to take our media rights seriously. And again, uh, we also need to understand that the value of your media rights is directly proportional to how popular your sport is. So what we need to do is to also ensure that we tell our stories, we make um, your clubs, the players, we make it as popular as possible. And for us to get to that point, there are a lot of little things we can do. We can leverage on social media to get that to happen. We can leverage on um, basic things as, you know, as simple as you know, quality photographs from league games to ensure that that happens. So if we try to do those um, little incremental things, increases the popularity of the sports which then eventually increases the value of your media rights so until we are ready to take media rights seriously i don't think basketball will grow um, as much as we want it to grow in africa because again uh, media rights is everything you, you need to get that um, broadcast money and there are things you can do as a club as a club as a federation to start that process leverage on social media leverage on um, digital media leverage on storytelling leverage on your players to increase the value of your sports, which ultimately increases the value of your media rights. So that's a place we need to focus on seriously so we can increase the um, variety of the sports in the continent. Okay. Uh, Reggie, I'm, I'm curious to know um, about the publicity element. How valuable is publicity um, for to grow the sport on the continent? I'm talking about print, not just TV as well, but print. Um, how important is, is it for fans and viewers of, or lovers of the sport to understand the different stories of our African basketball players and teams? Uh, I think the, the publicity is the basic to, 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 to grow the game. And without the commercials, without the sponsor, is difficult for a player, for a team, for a team uh, to, to or a, a federation to practice uh, basketball. And uh, we noticed that during this uh, period of uh, COVID, without uh, commercials, without uh, publicity, uh, the, uh, the, the federation will we, we, we be obliged to, to stop basketball. So uh, media, media need to media need to create content. Mm, media yeah. need to keep on to create uh, content, uh, uh, digital content, uh, broadcasts. And if there are, if there are so many broadcasts, TV show like Bimbo, for example, uh, the, the 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 sponsor. The, the commercials can be attract and come to uh, come to um, help help the basketball to grow. Now you, you've made a very very good point, uh, Reggie. You've mentioned sponsorship, and I wanted to ask uh, the both of you: what is the link between good publicity 
and getting sponsorship, which is a struggle for uh, African basketball so far. What are your thoughts, Reggie? Uh, to my mind, I think in Africa, in Africa, uh, there's the problem because of football. Uh, the commercials is is her. How, 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 how I can say this? The commercials uh, invest invest money in football uh, instead of basketball. Instead of basketball, oh, you know that basketball is the second sport in Africa, and uh, there's a lack. There's the lack of competition in uh, in Africa. The, the 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 I think the the commercials always uh, waiting for uh, Afro basket uh, the great competition to invest money. So uh, this is why the federation, the local federation, has has problem. Uh, to 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 how to say I, I lost I, I lost my English. <laughs> I lost my English. Generations have that's why they have that problem in raising yeah. uh, money to support uh, different uh, I guess league finances. Um, but Adedami, I want to know if you agree with Reggie on that uh, link between sponsorship and uh, publicity. Is there a strong link there? Absolutely, there, there's a direct link between um, how popular your event is and the commercial, the money you make from commercial partnership or sponsorship. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a conversation about two weeks ago um, and I was told that according to Star Times, um, the average viewers of the women's Afro baskets was less than 500. And Nigeria eventually won that tournament. And we had just, we had less than 500 viewers, um, TV viewers of that event. And again, you take this to any um, corporate organization for sponsorship and they tell you that, see, um, I need more eyes on your event for us to drop money to partner with you. So we need to, so there's a, there's a very direct link between how popular your sport is, what your viewership numbers are, and the commercial rights you get on those events. So we need to find a way to increase that popularity. And I'll also give you an example. Um, there's a strategy that FIBA adopted a couple of years ago where for every FIBA tournament you um, you follow, on their website, after every quarter, they post picture, they upload pictures. So at the end of the first quarter, you have quality images that you can share on your social media pages. And journalists across the continent, across the world, pick this up and they help people you know, push those events. And it's the same thing that happened for um, Afro-Basket, Afro-Basket women. The moment a game ends, you can see statistics, you can see images, you can write a full story. And those little things help in promoting those events and increasing popularity for your sports, which you can now tie back to a corporate partnership. Because if you can, um, if you can demonstrate to a corporate partner that you will bring this kind of rights or this kind of value or this kind of um, eyeballs on their product for all your events, then it becomes easy for you to you know, get their money. So yes, there's a direct link between how popular your sport is, the publicity you create around your events and the commercial partnership you get for, that, for those events. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for your uh, insights. Really appreciate it. We're gonna move on um, to our next topic. Uh, which is coaching. Uh, it, I feel like coaching is, a, is it the chicken or the egg thing? You know, a lot of people complain about the, the skill level of African players, um, maybe lack of three-point shooting, lack of, of structured uh, basketball. And we talk a lot about the players, but maybe it's a coaching issue. So I'm going to invite uh, Hervé Basog, who is the country coordinator for Giants of Africa in Cameroon. Uh, Basog, welcome. Welcome, uh, hello Silale, hello everybody. 
Good to have you here. I'd like to invite someone else, uh, Mr. Abel Nson, who is a scout for the Toronto Raptors. Uh, we're not going to talk about how the Raptors are doing right now, Abel. We, we're going to avoid that. So we're going we're to stay on task. We're going to stay on task. Uh, but gentlemen, um, both of you, both of you have been um, coaches at at very high levels um, in Cameroon and, and in Kenya. Uh, you, you heard my question, the issue of the chicken or the egg. In terms of lack of skill development in players, is it um, the fault of the players themselves, maybe lack of initiative, lack of training, or is it the coaches who are teaching the wrong thing to the players? Uh, let's, let's start with you, Basog. Oh, um, no, I can't. Um, you see, uh, players actually start playing from different situations. You have players who can actually start basketball in remote areas and uh, there are no coaches around, so they teach themselves how to play, you know, and the way they'll play will be different from uh, areas where you have uh, established coaches who will be giving some fundamentals, some direction to how those, those, those kids play. But um, the, the, the main idea, according to me, is uh, to create a culture of basketball that, you, that puts the emphasis on... Uh, a certain level of skills like shooting, passing, etc. You know, so it's it's uh, the, the the more our two are combined and also linked to sometimes the um, economic situation or the location or uh, where the, the 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 player has started playing. When you watch Angolans playing, you you can feel when you see the national team that uh, the Angolan players have um, a, a culture of sharing the ball and, and shooting. You know. But uh, let's say when you come to Cameroon, where you have great athletes and all that, it's uh, they learn how they learn how to shoot. And once in a while, you have uh, one miraculous shooter who teaches who teaches himself how to shoot, and then uh, makes 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 the makes the difference. But uh, I really feel that is the culture on uh, on coaching and uh, in playing that matters. You've been in East Africa, in Burundi, for example. Burundian players are always playing a very, very uh, technically skilled game in terms of dribbling, in terms of passing, and uh, way less physical ability. And somehow they dominated East Africa around uh, between 2014 and 2016. They were quite good. So that's what I, I, would, I would say. Okay. Um, well, we've, we've lost Abel there, but we'll wait um, for him to come back. In the meantime, um, Basog, I, I still feel like you've not quite answered my question um, because you've told me the importance of coaching, but, uh, oh dear, and it looks like I've lost Basog as well. Our apologies for that. Um, in the meantime, I think I can bring in... Uh, uh, we've lost to come back in the meantime. Hey, so I'm here. And uh, I don't know if Karabani is available. I'm trying to look for him, but uh, it looks it looks a little a little dicey. Let me bring in. Um, uh, so, gentlemen, I, I was trying to explain to to Basog. He he expressed very well the importance of coaching and how it develops a, um, the skills of a player. But my question is: Is the lack of ability of coaches the issue when it comes to a lack of skill in the players? Um, and if that is the case, does that, that mean that our coaches are not being uh, properly trained? Uh, let's start. Let's start with you, Eve. Oh yes, I, I think that is a a, a major issue. I, I think you should uh, strengthen the capacity of uh, our coaches. Uh, we know that uh, because right here you don't have uh, a national uh, organization uh, to 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 have the greatest of the coaches. So uh, uh, I think it's a major issue. You, you should have to to strengthen the capacity of uh, our our coaches to to have the better players. I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Eve. Um, uh, Victor, what what are your are your thoughts on that? Are coaches getting the appropriate um, uh, 
teachings, appropriate uh, lessons in, in understanding what it takes to be a coach. I mean, we have to go back to the basic. I know it's really like a cliche, but this this is what we have to do. Uh, we have to understand that we're not born with those muscles and those skills that the American players has. So we need we need we need to work on our one-on-one -on -one skills. Learn how to really get coach who know how to teach how to shoot, pass, and dribble the ball. Because if you don't have that. And then you, by years, you're going to get like the q and of the, the, the IQ of the game, etc. understand the position, etc. But the first thing, even when you play on the playground, is learn how to score the basket, at least know how to shoot. And with all those new information about offensive, defensive plays, you know, all this, coaches are looking for how to run the team. But a lot of them get a part about how to build a player because a player is just a reflect of his trainer who coached him during all the years. Okay, I was born with talent. That's great. But who shapes me? Silali, you play at a high level. And you will always remember one or two coaches who pass through your life help you to, to achieve such a point. You know? Absolutely. And this is, this, this is the main key right there. We have to understand that we have to grow the understanding of the group execution, but the one-on-one -on -one improvement players must start from the youngest players. So when they get to seniors, they know how to go left and score. They ought to catch and shoot before to learn how to do the step back fade away from 10 feet and miss 100 and make just one. I mean, yeah, I know Liz. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've brought in um, Coach Liz Mills, who's uh, uh, tuning in all the way from Australia. Thank you so much. I know I don't even want to know what time it is uh, over there, Coach Liz. Uh, I, I don't even want to know what time it is over here. <laughs> but um, thanks, Salali and Femi, for having me. Um, this is a really interesting subject because I actually think African coaches are some of the best self-taught coaches I've ever seen. Um, sure, the standard sometimes isn't great, but that's because of lack of opportunity. Um, I think it's really we need to point at FIBA, FIBA Africa, NBA, NBA Africa, and be like, why aren't there more coaching courses, coaching clinics, online courses that people can do? Obviously, we can't have um, courses in 54 countries. That's just not financially feasible. But uh, as much as we want to say, um, you know, coaches, the standard in coaching in Africa isn't where it should be. I think we should also pat on the back coaches in Africa for teaching themselves the lessons of coaching. I had the ability to do all my degrees in Australia and we have great coaching courses, but that isn't the same for African co coaches. Uh, to discuss your point, I think given the fact that they don't have the same opportunities to learn, they're, that's going to impact on their ability to work with coach to work with players across the continent. I am um, I 100% agree with Victor and um, the other coaches in terms of we actually have to focus on youth development. By the time they get to senior basketball and they're working with me, I shouldn't have to teach them how to do a left hand layup, how to run offenses, and how to run defenses. This is we need coaching curriculums. We need coaching clinics. We need all these things before we can we can really grow the game on the continent. Right, right. Um, and I mean, I can't find Abel or uh, Coach Basog. Um, so I'm going to ask you this, um, Coach Liz. We're talking about very good points there. Um, and again, big shout out to all the coaches who are self-taught and really have that passionate that passion to teach younger kids, even with the limited knowledge that they have. Uh, we're talking about the youth now talent identification and uh, the junior leagues, because really you're starting basketball in high school, that's, that's way too late. So we're talking about now, and it ties in with coaching as well, because kids have to be taught the right things at a young age. Otherwise they have to unlearn that and then learn the right, the right way to shoot, the right way to do a layup, um, the correct understanding of, of, of the game of basketball later on. Just how important is it to identify talent at a young age for, for coaches and for scouts like even um, Abel and how does that affect 
the junior leagues that now feed into the senior leagues? I've been coaching in Africa since uh, 2011, and I think um, it's, it's got to be said, the development of junior leagues across the continent has improved significantly since then. Uh, the introduction of private leagues, the NBA Junior League, um, I was part. I saw in Zambia the youth, um, the youth league there. Then we've got um, regional leagues across the continent. Now we've got Afro Basket for under 16s, under 18s, etc. So there is now a pathway for players. Um, I think it's we understand that we need to encourage players at primary school. So how do we? Um, start implementing primary school leagues. As much as we want to develop club leagues, we want to develop basketball in the education institutions, starting from under eights, mini ball, and educating not only schools, but parents on the benefits of sport in general. I cannot stress how hard, stress more the fact that we actually don't want players to just be solely playing basketball when they're eight, nine, ten. The more sports these players play, the better it is for them. Cross skill helps them become better at an elite level. So as much as we want to push basketball at a junior level, we also want to encourage these athletes to play multiple sports. Um, I'll leave Coach Herve because he's the expert in juniors. To yes, yes. I mean, that's a really good point that you made, though, about um, making sure kids are involved in diverse sports. I mean, case in point, people like Pascal Siakam, who played football at a younger age, look at his footwork right now. Um, exactly. Even Hakim Olajuwon, uh, Dikembe Mutombo. These are people who, like, they really played other sports, and then that now spilled into their skill level in basketball. And um, I think we have lost uh, Basog again there, uh, and I was about to, you know, he's he's the country coordinator for Giants of Africa um, exactly. in, in Cameroon. So I really want to try and get his views on that. Let's see if we can get him back on here. I really think also, Salali, that not only is it important that we don't push young athletes to a specific sport early, it's also important for their mental health. Um, we don't want to be pushing, oh, you're going to be elite at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, if you're playing multiple sports, the enjoyment factor, the ability to not feel that pressure yet, that's really important as well. Right, right. Um, Coach uh, Basog, we're talking about talent identification and uh, the junior leagues, and I know this is um, right up your alley. I'd really uh, like to hear your views on um, just how important it is to teach kids the right things um, when they're young and uh, based on what also Coach Liz said, how, how young is too young? And how important is, is it to diversify um, sports kids are involved in so that it can spill into their skill level later? And I can see his connection is not good at all. Uh, Basog, are you still with us? Okay. I think I think um, his connection is, is really weak, so we're going to have to move on to the next topic. Thank you so much, Liz, for coming in and uh, sharing uh, your views. We really appreciate that and your knowledge on that topic. Um, the next topic we're going to be talking about is national leagues and local players. And I'm going to bring in um, Eve uh, Tsala, who was in earlier, and Adedami, who was also talking about um, uh, media. Uh, just a moment. Uh, gentlemen, welcome back. Um, we're talking about national leagues and the local players. Uh, and I'd like to just kick off with um, something that, uh, you know, for the people who are watching, we're in a WhatsApp group and we have very heated arguments about very <laughs> different topics. And one of the arguments we've had is about uh, Afrocan. I think the inaugural Afrocan was, was last year and we were discussing about how tournaments that are catered uh, specifically for local players and for local leagues, does that elevate the level of competition and skills um, in our, 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 our national leagues and local players? What are your thoughts on that, Adedami? Um, I, I think well, it's very important to find a balance between what the objective is and what the impact will be for our players. One, the objective is let's have more competitions 
where our local players can feature. Question again is, does that help our local players? And I'll say yes, it does. But most importantly is what those players and you know, the national leagues within different countries can make out of competitions like that. Because again, if you don't increase the level of competition or professionalism in your individual country, then the level of African itself would, um, it won't be something to write home about. So you need to go back first and improve the level of your national needs so that the quality of players you bring to African will make a difference and will add value to the competition. So it goes back to what African will feed from the level of competition or level of professionalism of your local leagues. And if that is not sorted, then the quality of players you have are African, then um, again, it will be a problem. So we need to go back and fix the root problem first before we can focus on African. Yes, in, the, in terms of the objective of the um, competition to increase um, continental tournaments, yeah, it makes sense. But again, it doesn't fully solve the problem if we don't fix the national needs. Okay. Um, Eve, what are your thoughts um, on that as well? Um, I, I would say that it is important to, to have this competition because uh, we need uh, more competition for our local players. We don't have enough competition. So uh, this kind of uh, competition, uh, it is very important for local players because, you know, uh, when you have the Afro bucket, uh, uh, we have 12 professional players. Uh, in, in the national team. So uh, our local players are complaining about that, that we don't have enough competition. And so uh, we bring one competition where they, they, they can play. Uh, so it is something important to say, a add value. But uh, like uh, uh, the, we, we say, uh, it is not enough. Uh, we need to, to improve uh, the, all the ecosystem of our national basketball to to really grow, but it is important to to have this Afro African. I can see it, I can feel it uh, when uh, you know the the first edition Cameroon was not there, and the the players right there were complaining about that. How we, we can play even this competition if uh, we don't have any places uh, in the Afro basket and uh, in, in the club we don't. Uh, go every time. So uh, we need this kind of competition. We need uh, those challenges for our local players. Yes, yes. Um, now, for the both of you, do you think that um, having these kind of tournaments will help, uh, you know, during times for for over major competitions overseas, for instance, we're always looking for players who are out of the continent. Um, will that create a situation where we see more local players um, being selected to the final selection for maybe club championships um, and fewer international players coming in? Once, you know, we have opportunities to grow the talent uh, uh, locally. What are your thoughts, Adedami? I, I don't think African will automatically make that happen. Because what would there's a risk that what we'd see happen is local players being satisfied with just playing in African than making an effort to be a part of the team that goes for Afro basket. You understand? So um, not to make them complacent or like a dicycle in stepping up their game, they might just be comfortable with playing in African and that would be that for them. So as much as, yeah, African has a role to play, um, like I said earlier, it doesn't solve that problem. It doesn't automatically guarantee that players would now you know, be eligible to play for you know, the national team that goes for major international tournaments, say the Olympics or FIBA Afro Baskets. People might just see it as, okay, this is the level at which we play and we're satisfied with it. You understand? So it doesn't automatically guarantee that it will increase the level of um, local, local players and will make them eligible to be part of the international sport. It doesn't. Mm. That in itself doesn't guarantee that. Um, Eve, do you share the, the same sentiments? Uh, uh, partially, because I think um, it is uh, Im important. You, you can make an African and then you want to, to, to go a, a step 
uh, a step forward. So uh, making a focus uh, should not uh, make you satisfied to, to stay at this stage. Uh, after the African, you, you can uh, be uh, able to, to play for the Afro basket. And, and I think it can be a motivation for the players to, to, to try to, to reach uh, an, another, another step. So uh, uh, I'm not totally agree with, uh, with my brother. Yes. Um, and, and then now, which leads me to, to my next question, uh, the Basketball Africa League. Um, we talk of the of the entire continent, really. How will having that kind of league impact local players, where it's a league that is formatted that to invite or try to create an allowance for a lot of international players to come in? So, how will again to repeat the question? How will the basketball African league impact the situation with with national leagues and local players in terms of um, their skill level and their opportunities as well? If we can start with you. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm happy because uh, our team is going to be uh, at the last stage of the competition, uh, FAP. So we are going to have a representative right here. And uh, what we saw yeah, in, in Yaoundé was fantastic, I think. You see uh, all the this public to encourage FAP and to see... Uh, all those players. I, I think um, first, uh, what uh, the ball brings is uh, more visibility. Uh, you see, we 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 saw uh, more coaches right here uh, in Cameroon to 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 know uh, who is Fab, the players of Fab. Uh, so it, it is important, and to to have all those competition, even. Uh, in our local countries, because uh, as I said earlier, we don't have enough competition to have all those countries uh, come to play here, yeah, GSP of Alger, uh, IS Police, uh, it was something special. And I think uh, all the, the players we have um, uh, were very motivated to, to play with the, this public. And I think, uh, the, the presence of the American players to uh, help our local players uh, improve their skills, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw it with the, the, the point guard, uh, Rosenden, and the, the, the way uh, he plays with the, uh, uh, the, the forward, uh, Gome, etc. And I, I see, I can see that after those, this, this competition, uh, when we, we, we went back, to our national championship, uh, we saw something different uh, with, with our local players. So I, I really think that uh, the, the Basketball Africa League is a good thing uh, for uh, our, our local country. Okay, all right. Um, as, and as we wrap up this particular uh, topic, Adedami, tell me, do you think uh, the Basketball Africa League helps or hurts um, the local leagues and local players? Um, it doesn't hurt them, it helps them. Again, let's remember that um, the Basketball Africa League is just an evolution of the FIBA Africa Champions Cup. We've always had a continental um, championship. This is just um, making sure that it is a lot more professional. So it doesn't hurt, right? It helps. But what we need to do is now take a step further and to take away, um, to look at how professionally run the Basketball Africa League is and take that back into our that individual um, national leagues. One, one thing that we can see from Basketball Africa League is um, the investment in the league itself, right? The set of people running the league itself. And that's something we can learn from the national league to say that, look, basketball, professional basketball has gone beyond just um, government money or government funding. You need the right set of investors. You need private investors to run professional basketball, you need the right set of people because only when you run it from a professional perspective as a business, only when you do that is when we can create value for the professional players. That is when you can create an ecosystem of businesses around the league itself 
and that is when you can properly develop basketball. And that's what we, that's what we are saying with Basketball Africa League. The amount of professionalism, you know, in play, um, in put into running the league, the amount of private funding put into running the league, it just sets a blueprint that the national leagues can adopt and say, look, if we can get this, if basketball from the continental perspective can get this kind of funding and this kind of people and this kind of investors and corporate partners, then we can also come back to our national league and see how we can develop, how we can invite private people to run it or to get involved in it and increase the professionalism. So no, Basketball Africa League will not hurt um, the National League. It will help them. It will also motivate them and show them that, see, when you do things properly, miracles can happen. So I'm excited about it. I only hope that National Leagues and National Federations and the participating teams can learn something from it and take it back you know, to their own local games and their local leagues. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for those views, gentlemen. Uh, we'll now move on uh, to the next topic. Um, as our time is not too bad, we have just two more uh, subtopics on this, on this conversation. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the stunted growth of basketball in Africa and the major factors towards um, uh, that end. Right now, we're going to be talking about the national teams and I'm gonna invite uh, Albert Ahabwe, who is um, coming in from Uganda. He's currently uh, the Uganda national team manager. Albert, good to have you on here. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Let me unmute you. Hold on, Albert, you're, I think you're muted. Just unmute on your end. Yep, yep. Can you hear there me you now? I can hear you now. Uh. Always glad to be uh, here, Selale. A chance to discuss African basketball. Love it. I've been absolutely. following the discussion. And, uh, it's fun. Yeah. It truly is. And I think it's going to be a good team of people talking about this particular topic. Uh, Liz, we saw you earlier. Welcome back. And um, the man himself, Victor Muzadi, will be joining us shortly. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, Albert and Coach Liz. Coach Liz, you have been involved with numerous um, national teams uh, here in Africa. I feel like you really understand the ins and outs of, of that system. Uh, Albert, you have been the team manager of uh, Uganda's national team. And I feel like you, Uganda is really the poster child for basketball development in East Africa and you know, deciding on a strategy and implementing that strategy and seeing that strategy uh, come into fruition. Basketball in Uganda, the national team, uh, the, uh, 10 years ago and who they are today, it's night and day. So um, starting with you, Albert, really what, what do you think are the keys to success um, for uh, Uganda's national team over the past several years to get them to where they are uh, today? Um, again, thank you, Silale. I think for us um, as a national team, as a country, um, we got to a point where we decided that it, it wasn't good enough for us to keep participating at these international champions championships as opposed to competing. And this was around uh, 2013. We had had a few runs where we kept going to the tournament. You look around the tournament and the, and the type of players that are in the tournament compared to the ones that you have, and you can actually see that you have enough talent to be able to not just compete, but to beat everyone at the tournament. But for some reason, you just never do that. So going into the 2013 um, Zone 5 Championship in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, we just took an appraisal of ourselves and said, look, this is what we have. This is what it would do because we saw what we were doing um, in the club championships, how competitive we were in the club championships with these same players against the players that would then come players in national team competitions and, 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 and would be no game for them. So we discovered that our problem was preparation, our problem was organization, was putting in place the right coaches, the right fit. You could have a very good coach, but he's not a fit for the national team program, you could have very uh, good players, but they don't fit in the model 
of national team basketball because national team basketball happens every once in a while. So for you to be able to go there and be successful, you have to put all the pieces together that are able to match what you want out of your program. So we made an appraisal of ourselves. First, we separated the national team program from the rest of the programs of the, of the national federation. The president at that time uh, appointed a general manager for the national team program. So the general manager was tasked to go out and look for people who he could work with to run a good national team program that would bring Uganda back to competition. And that's mm -hmm. how our national team management committee came up. We formed a committee of about five people. It was later reduced to about three people. Now we are mostly three people plus the president because we report directly to the president of the federation who then tells his executive and the general assembly what we are doing on the national team end. But as far as the national team is concerned, we are a, a group of three guys we ran it. Uh, we added a lady, uh, our former national team uh, captain of the of the Gazelles, uh, Vic Entale. We added her, so we are now four people. We have a conversation between ourselves. Whatever we do, we uh, we report to to the federation president, and he reports to the executive and whoever. So I think that's a model that could work for for not everybody. There are teams that are, are established. There are federations that are established that have been doing this. For a very long time, um, Victor would, would tell you that they've been doing it for a very long time. So for them, they have an established system they run. But I would advise that for small countries that are just starting to put together a national team program and to try to grow their brand and, and get competitive, that would be a very good place to start. Have a small group of people who's, who are very intentional, who are very focused on the national team program, and, and that's top to bottom, from the under-16s to the under-18s, all the way to the senior teams. Have a small group of people whose attention and intention and resources are directly towards running the national team program and build it from there. That's what we've done. Thank you for that, Albert. I think that's, that's a great description of what to do right. Now, Liz, you've interacted, as I said earlier, with a lot of um, national teams on the other end, what do you think national teams and uh, national team organizations, um, the leadership committee, are doing wrong, which has led to the stunted growth of uh, African basketball development? I think there's um, several factors that have had a negative impact on national teams. I think it starts with the selection of co the coaching staff and the support staff. Um, a lot of national teams come in with just a head coach and assistant coach, don't have physios, don't have doctors. And so not having that right group at the top has a major impact. Secondly, I would say that federation interference in the selection process of the team. Um, I've seen this numerous times. Head coaches have no say whatsoever or the coaching staff have no say whatsoever in the selection of their, their players. Um, sure, everybody's opinion is val valued, but at the end of the day, it's the coach who has to make the calls and it's up to them to be able to select their 12. Um, they have a vision that they want to carry out and that's not necessarily going to happen with the players that a federation picks. I also think that a positive that has come in since 2017 is the FIBA four-year qualification window. So we now see national teams having to play two rounds of Afro basket qualifiers. This year we put in pre-qualifiers, which was great. So we have countries who haven't made Afro basket before competing. We saw South Sudan, we saw Kenya, we saw Madagascar competing in these international to continental tournaments for the first time. We have four windows for the World Cup qualifiers. So now that we have more, t more on our national team schedule, we are going to have better ability for these teams to prepare for those major tournaments like AfroBasket and the World Cup. It also means that we need to engage, engage our players on a regular basis. Um, I know when I was with Cameroon and um, when I was with Zambia, Zambia had seven weeks to prepare for qualifiers. Cameroon, we had four days. So how do you expect a national team to work well if you have such a short preparation time. But those are really the three major factors that I think have really impacted the growth of national teams 
across the continent. Right. Um, now, Victor, I want to bring you in on the conversation um, because Angola is, 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 Uganda is the poster child in East Africa. Angola is the, the, has been the king and the poster child for all of Africa, the entire continent in terms of their national team success. Yeah, Albert, I'm, I'm feeling the fire. Uh, so, Victor, I want to know, we talked about the team there, we talked about the things you should not do as a national team. Let us know now, what are the key as a national team to staying on top consistently year after year um, and, and just try and make it as brief as possible as we, as we work with time? So, basically, I will say you need to build a culture. You need to build a culture of winning of sharing and play together. Um, you will not be every time on the top of your game, but if you can trust your teammates and you know what they do good consistently because you play against him and you know him and you'll be around him because our preparation sometimes for uh, African Championship take two to three months, sometimes three months preparations out of our natural environment. And from that, you really know who actually share the room with you, who share the floor with you. It's not just a jersey. No, this jersey have a soul and spirit and have emotions. So you know when he's on the top of his game that you know that you look, today he have all the confidence of the world, I have to share the ball for him with him. And preparation. You guys have to know what you're doing on the court know your mission you know i'm here i'm defender i already know that albert will be scoring more than me because he's the guy who actually is our scorer so this is another point and preparation you must prepare you have to be fully equipped you know from your physical aspects for your mentally because every come on the top is your confidence is how well you can handle the pressure and we have that, I guess, Uganda, Albert. You remember? Uh, if you guys almost beat us, but we didn't We didn't quit. Look, we have 30 seconds. The game is not over yet. This year, we need to do something, just one thing. They will give up because if they, they, they won the I game. Did. They didn't, you know, you know, I have to put, I always have to put the dagger on you. You know me. So that's a great example. It's not just... This be club, taller, be club. stronger, you know. Club. But yeah, but this this small things is a confidence and and actually mentally, physical, mental aspect of it help you to be great and keep winning. Because when you see Kobe Bryant, is a guy who when doing twenty years in the same locker room, playing and be around, you know, the thing. So we know African Federation have a lot of issues, organization, we have to improve. It's a great moment to actually fix those things that Coach Lee is listing, or is like the physio, players recuperation. That's why you see a lot of players, they're getting young on the national team, and at the end of the career, they're a little bit out because of this following up. You talk about the recuperation, scouting report, you know, have technology around, it's impossible. Angola, a lot of people say, ah, Angola was great for this year. You know how many players we sacrifice on the way? You play from January to December. You go on the world tour, you just like six, eight, six, ten on your good days, you play against a guy like Yao Ming. And then you come back here, you play against Nigeria, Olomide's boys, you know, for all year. You don't have time to rest. You know, it's great, but you have a you have to a, a high pay, high price to pay. And if you don't have the the stuff that Coach Lee say, the stuff around to to recover your players, that's going to be a, a not a long run, but a short run. So all this is a time for us to really like bring together COVID situation, learn that players as well, what we are here. It's about the players. It's not about federation. It's even not about the coaches. It's about the players. We're here because of the players. And then because of the fans. Then the coaches and all the stuff around. So we have to put all together to have great players so we can have great shows. 
great execution, great teams. Now we can create the industry. So we start locally before we go to the ball, invest locally, then we can have great opportunity on the ball. Ball is a great platform, but if locally we, we suck, we will not be brilliant at the ball. Sorry about that, but that's the way I see it. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. That, that's, I think that's the great comments right there. Um, and unfortunately, our time is, is almost up. I want us to handle the last um, topic here. I'm going to take you out, Liz and uh, Victor. Again, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, I'm going to bring in Karabani um, from Tanzania. Karabani, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello? We can't see you, though. Um, I don't know why. Can you see me now? Oh, you, no. You you need to you need to work on your camera. You probably have canceled your camera. Or maybe. But um, as as Karabani works on works on that, um, let's just yeah. talk about uh, the topic at hand. Um, now I know this this is a topic that's dear to your heart, Albert. Uh, if you're very passionate about this, but I want us to talk a little bit as we as we wrap up, gentlemen. I don't want to take longer than really five uh, max six minutes on this. Um, we're talking about zoning um, yeah. and language when it comes to FIBA Africa. Now, um, yeah. how Albert? How are zones determined actually? Because you know, there's a weird situation where you have uh, Zone Five, a bunch of East African countries, and then Egypt who are all the way up in North Africa are somehow in our zone. How is, just briefly explain to us how zoning is determined by FIBA Africa. I have had uh, this conversation about zoning um, with some officials from FIBA Africa um, in passing, of course. Uh, but one of the things that confuses me the most, because these officials suggest that these zones were done organically in terms of people's uh, regions geographical reason in regions where that doesn't make sense is that basketball is a sport it's not politics or science or some 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 stuff it's it's a sport so for you to put people to compete against each other you have to put people that have that share a lot of things in common for them to be able to compete against each other because not only do they compete against each other there's also relations between federations, between players, between all these types of stuff, which is why we get confused when we see Egypt, which is at the top of the, of the continent, being mixed together with East African countries. It doesn't make sense. Why? You see most of these zones and you look at the countries that are in these zones, and, and they have things in common. They have languages in common, most of them. If they are Francophones, they are together. If they are Anglophones, they are together. Unless they are Anglophones and Francophones that are very close to each other, like how it happens in West Africa. You have countries like Niger that are in the same uh, area with, with Nigeria. So they, they end up, uh, they end up uh, playing in the same zone just because they are geographically close to each other. But the thing that confuses most people is, for example, the case of Egypt. Egypt, they speak Arabic, even though some of them speak English, uh, but they speak Arabic, they are geographically very distant from us. But more importantly, they have countries that are right next to them that are in zone one. That is Libya, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. So geographically, if that's what the explanation is, that's the zone in which they are supposed to be. But somehow, they end up in East Africa. So I came to the conclusion that they are probably in East Africa, because at the time of this zoning, Egypt has always been a superpower in the administration of basketball in Africa. So they got themselves out of the region where competition is very stiff and you could end up losing a spot because there's Tunisia, there's Morocco, there's Algeria, there's Libya. Libya used to be a pretty good basketball team until they got uh, political problems. So every one of the four countries in that zone was so good. That's why they brought themselves to, a, to a, a, a zone where there are already 12, Afri 12 East African countries. So now, that Albert, creates that, a situation that, where that you have... 
theory or is that a conspiracy theory? Because I also want it, Karabani it's a cons Kana. It's, a cons it's a, definitely, it's a conspiracy theory because there was no way of explaining it. There's no other way of explaining it where you have a zone one where Egypt is next to that has four countries. Zone one has four countries and zone five has 13 countries. So how's a country that's supposed to be in zone one in zone five with 13 other countries when zone one has four countries and still gets two slots at AfroBasket? Karbani, do you agree make sense. with that? Do you agree with, uh, with Albert's sentiments on, on that? I totally agree with them. I feel there is, there is some kind of conspiracy behind that. I've been asking that question throughout and it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Why would they bring him all the way to zone five? It just does not make sense if it's not. Well, it could be the problem is Anglophone doesn't have that much representation out there. And it could be that our voices, our voices are not heard from zone five because I'm actually also in zone five, speaking from Tanzania out here. That could be the case. But as for now, we can only speculate I don't know where we could get that answer, but I know a lot of people from Zone 5 are kind of pertur perturbed about this matter. Why is Egypt in this zone instead of playing in Zone 1? It just doesn't make sense to a lot of us. Right. I mean, uh, getting from basically what you guys are saying and what we hear on the ground, there's almost like an unspoken rivalry between Anglophone basketball culture and leadership and Francophone basketball culture. I mean, where, where does that, besides, of course, the, the language barrier, where does that actually stem from, Karabani? Well, I mean, I would say we have adopted a mistake that the AU was made or OAU back in them days, because when you look at it, the representation, or should I say they adopted three languages um, uh, 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 for use in their meetings and documentation, and that is French, English, and Arab, right? When you look at it, I'm, I'm surprised why Arab is there because Arab, it's about 70, 70 million people in Africa speak Arabic, whereby more than 100 million speak Kiswahili, and yet Kiswahili is not in there. And, and then you look at it, even if we take it a little further, Hausa, it's, it's over, uh, uh, um, it's, it's the second widely spoken language also in Africa. And, and, and there are more people speaking Ausa than actually English or French on a daily basis. And yet that's not in there. We've chosen languages that we've gotten from our colonial masters and are using them right now. And a lot of our countries or a lot of our people see themselves as ang Anglophone or Francophone. And I feel like this has been that mistake for, for so long. We've adopted that and we are using that in basketball. When you look at it right now, in a lot of the meetings, the meetings are in French. If not in French, then they're in French. <laughs> it's pretty much they're in, in French. French all the time. All the time. Yeah, that's all what the I'm time. saying. They're in French. It's, it's in French yeah. or in French. And when you go out there, if you do not have a translator, you're by the side, you don't know what's going on. Majority of the tournaments are held in the West. Now, traveling, going to the West, it's really expensive. I'll tell you that. If it's not in the West, it's in Madagascar also. That's also French. It is really expensive going out there. I know my team going out there, FIBA 3-on-3, three three, it was really expensive. One ticket is 1150 US dollars just going out there. It makes it really hard for a lot of these countries traveling, going out there. It's a lot easier for the Francophone to actually participate. So I'm saying they have a lot of... It, it, things are put in such a way where it's a lot easier for them to get the necessary uh, uh, outcomes that they go for. So the issues have been there for a very long time. And of course, the languages do not help. But everything that we are doing right now is just perpetuating what's already been there. And we are adopting from all these political issues that we've had in Africa for a long period of time. Right, right. I mean, and I, um, have, I have, Silale, I have two, two. Two examples that, that I've always given people about this problem between Anglophones and Francophones, because it's disheartening, especially if it's your first time there. I've always complained to FIBA about two things. The first time I, I went to a FIBA Africa uh, national team tournament, that's the first time we qualified in 2015. We get to Tunisia, and uh, after we play the first day, 
uh, on the next morning, FIBA calls um, a, a, a meeting because they were going to introduce the new format of qualification. So they called all the teams to the room. We are in the room um, of the 16 teams that were there. Um, about about eight or nine were, were francophone. Uh, there were three Portuguese, that is Mozambique, Cape Verde, and Angola. Um, then the rest were English. Ourselves, uh, Uganda, um, Nigeria, uh, um, Zimbabwe. There were not many. We were not many English-speaking countries. These guys speak French for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And when you complain, they interpret for you what they've said in 30 minutes in 30 seconds. It doesn't make sense. So I stood up twice. On the second time, I said, Dr. Billy, I'm starting to think you guys are talking about us. Like you guys are hatching a gun or something against us. It doesn't make sense. How can we be in the same meeting? You know, we don't have equipment to interpret. You speak French for 30 minutes. And when we insist on getting a conversation about what you are saying, you tell us what you said in 30 minutes, in 30 seconds. It didn't make sense to me. After the meeting, the guy from Angola walked up to me and told me, in Angola, we come here, they speak French, we beat them, we take the trophy. You do the same. <laughs> Second thing I complained about, the, the FIBA Africa monthly update on YouTube. It's always in French. No subtitles, no interpretation, no nothing. FIBA has an update every month, every month on YouTube, and they send out something on, on, on FIBA Africa website. It's always in French. It's like everybody else doesn't exist. They just put out a French update, 30 minutes on YouTube, and, and nothing else for the, Franco, for the Anglophones. But you have so many countries that are participating and competing that are from these, con these countries. So unless you intend as an organization and put in place measures to improve this, the disconnect is always going to be there. And it starts so, from the officials at, at FIBA Africa and the way they address you when you speak to them. It's, so it's I'll, like this. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but, but our time really is bad. Yeah. I just want to, because no I, I, wanna, no I don't want us to end on a low. I want, do want to end this on a high. Yeah. Um, and and sure. for me, I'm very solution oriented. So, gentlemen, how do we how do we bridge this gap um, uh, without being all kumbaya, my lord? Uh, Africa yeah. unites. We are all one, one currency. We're talking about FIBA Africa. How do we bridge this gap, and how do we make it more inclusive for the Anglophone speakers and the Francophone speakers, Karabani? I feel we need to have better representation. We need to have more reps from the Anglophone countries, not just Anglophone countries. I feel like all the countries, I mean, the different languages that, that do exist in the continent of Africa, it's almost impossible, like you said, it's not going to be kumbaya, let's come together, or just decide to adopt a, a language right now and then everybody speaks that language. It would be great if we could have one language that Africans do speak, but unfortunately that's not the case. As of right now, yeah. it's just representation from different places. That's that's what we lack. When you look at it, zone five right now, unfortunately our leader is also from Egypt. So as you can see, we don't have that kind of representation. It goes we back voted to the him. same thing. We voted him ourselves. <laughs> Well, well, some, 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 sometimes, sometimes uh, you do understand that they do ask you, were you under duress? At times we are under duress when we choose certain things because we feel like, okay, this guy, or whatever. okay, let's not get into that and get all political. I feel it's representation. It needs to come down to representation. We need better representation. We need people from Anglophone to also step up. And at the same time, FIBA needs to understand if we are going to develop this game, it's not just, you know, let's focus on uh, on the region that's performing better because it is true. Francophone is performing better than Anglophone. That's there's no discussion right there, but there has to be some effort to actually uplift or help the other re uh, regions. And that could mean certain uh, 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 um, uh, competitions or tournaments being held there to inspire or at least to make it easily accessible. Or it could be with some of the fees because certain countries just do not want to participate now. They've given up. They're like, you know what? Oh, well, 
we going out there, it's not going to happen. There's so many fees that we need to pay or we are back on our fees and all that. And we just not going to participate now. So everything is catered for the very same people and meetings. Instead of two years, we could have meetings on a, on a more frequent basis or at least on a regional base more frequently. So actually some of our grievances could be heard. I feel like that's maybe the way we could move forward. Right, right. Um, Albert, briefly, anything else to add um, to, to those possible solutions? Yeah, and I, I, I like what Karaban is saying, but I also feel that on the competition end, we need to do better as Anglophones. We need to keep pushing ourselves to do better. I was very, very happy with the performance of Kenya at AfroCan because that's a voice for us, for them to go there and do what they did uh, in that tournament, get to the finals, beat seasoned teams that have better leagues, more funded, because essentially African focuses on players that come from our home leagues. So for players from a home league like Kenya to go out there and perform the way they did, I was extremely, extremely proud. And, and it's going to take performances like that for us to be able to enter a meeting and speak and be heard, because now if they can respect the product that we put on the basketball court, then they will eventually start to respect the view that we give. The, uh, the challenge of, 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 of the fees that, that Karaban is talking about, it comes from the same representation that he talks about. As, as uh, We have to put in place representatives that go out there and, and, and help us solve problems of FIBA being the organization that takes, 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 never gives anything. You look at all these other sports, their international federations, bring something back to the home federations that participate in their championships. FIBA never gives anything. It just takes, takes, takes. So we, our representation, whoever we vote into our office says, let's take, back our, let's take back our zone. Let's get someone from the zone who understands the zone, who understands the region to step up and, and, and be a representative of the zone. Let's get guys from Nigeria. The champions of, 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 of uh, Nigeria have been the champions both in the women and in the men. They, they, they understand the need for the anglophone so they have to be able to represent better on their end as well co com um, combine together an effort of, of 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 all the teams from the anglophone countries we have got to step up we have got to make it impossible for ourselves to be ignored both on the basketball court and in the boardroom so it's on our end to step up right right well gentlemen thank Agreed. you so much um for these insights uh you sh I wish you could see the comments. People are going insane about this particular topic. In fact, they're saying that we need to have an entire session dedicated solely to this particular topic. I feel like this is, it's a bit emotional, but it's something it that is. needs to happen. Oh, for, for and, and Silale, before we go, before we go, before we go, I wanted to give kudos to a, a country from our zone that has constructed a beautiful international standard facility, Rwanda, and now they are hosting all these tournaments. So to also tell our countries that if we can construct facilities that are as good as Rwanda, if the facility is beautiful, if it's world-class, the tournaments are going to come to you. Since last year when that facility opened, Rwanda has got under 16, they have got ball qualifiers, they were supposed to get the ball finals. Now there's talk that, Afri that FIBA Africa is requesting Rwanda to host three groups of the African basket qualifiers in December and November. So if you build a beautiful facility, you will bring yourself to the conversation. And now Rwanda cannot be ignored because besides Senegal and Rades in, in, in uh, Tunis, nobody has a stadium as big as them for basketball. So we have to bring things like that to the table to be able to be recognized. And I'm glad it's someone from, it's a country from our zone that is doing it. I'm also glad, Albert. Totally I'm also true. glad. True. Uh, thank you, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, thank for your you. Time. Really appreciate appreciate you having. Thank uh, you, Selale. Um, and that brings us actually to the end of this African basketball conversation. I'm going to bring Femi uh, back into the stream. Femi, it was brilliant. Um, people shared such incredible insights, um, mm -hmm. and and really, I think African basketball is in good hands. I always I always tell you that uh, we need to make sure that the people who are the true stakeholders and investors and voices of African basketball are viewed and are viewed as such. 
we can't let anyone else dictate who those people are. And uh, according to me, the, the, the 10 people that were in this um, particular conversation are, are some of the greatest minds on the continent when it comes to African basketball. I'm sure our second edition will have um, other great minds representing from, I'd like to see some more people from South Africa, um, some more from Northern Africa to, to discuss on different topics around African basketball. But I really enjoyed that and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Thank Salari, very for doing a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, I, I must um, commend the way you handle things. A lot of, you know, as if some some people were quite a handful to deal with. I don't want to mention any names, <laughs> but, but it, it was really enlightening. I've been going through all the comments, and it's been very interesting. And I got one particularly very interesting one. You know, who was like, "These guys are quite smart. They know the key game," and I'm like. Well, that, that's exactly what, what we plan to do, bring you the best minds um, across the continent who, who follow this game passionately. You know, it's more like a daily job for, for most of, of us, you know, um, that are talking about this. So, so it's, it's, it's pure passion. I, I want to thank everybody who has joined through. Um, I've been, it's been really a roller coaster trying to get through Twitter and YouTube and figuring out what's going on on, on Facebook just to see what people are saying. And so we can take all the feedback and use that to, to plan, you know, for, for the next. Um, we won't be releasing any dates now, so just keep following um, Ball Africa, uh, Ball's Activation Interest and Leadership in Africa. Um, that's um, the, the non-profit who, you know, organize this. And I want to thank everybody uh, who has supported this um, from um, our colleague Rant Baki, um, where Slali, you know, does our thing. Uh, Muzadi Court for coming through. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate Bibo Niger from Nigeria as well. And Ovoa Basket, um, that's Mr. Regis in the building um, and his partner, um, Richard Sikabi. Um, you guys have been amazing. Um, trust me, this is just the beginning in Africa. Um, and we, we mean it when we say this is going to be a turning point you know, for basketball in Africa. Yes, we will talk, but we'll also walk. Uh, trust me, we will walk this talk uh, at some point, but, but we need to get the conversation going. Let more years hear this. So please share these videos um, across your platform. Um, let people know that a conversation is going on for basketball on this continent. We are ready to do things better, ensure that um, this goes around all the corners um, of the continent. By the way, in case you missed it, we're able to put our footprint across all the zones um, in in um, Africa. When I say zones, I don't mean the FIBA zones that is controversial. Um, I mean, we covered East and um, Southern Africa um, with, of course, Angola. Uh, we had Tanzania in there. Um, Uganda, we we're able to cover North Africa with Tunisia. We had Central and um, West Africa with Cameroon and, you know, and, and Nigeria. So we, we tried to you know, have our footprint across the continent. We we'll, we'll continue to look uh, towards that direction and um, we'll bring in more topics for you uh, to discuss. So just keep it a date with us. Thank you for tuning in. This is history in the making and it's just the first step in a thousand more steps and in a thousand miles. So um, Silali, uh, thank you for being a very lovely host. Um, I think on behalf of the entire team, I want to say thank you and it's good night from me.